today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, we're in for a treat today. Our speaker is uh, Jim Cusick, uh, who's uh, uh, probably one of the foremost experts in early Florida history, and, and he's got some things to share to us. Now, norm, for, for us, normally, um, Boyd Murphy um, makes the introduction of this, the formal introduction of the speaker. Boyd is the coordinator of our uh, of the of the whole program, um, and he introduces his his colleagues. But Boyd has a um, another commitment today, so he sent me some material that I'm going to uh, uh, share with you um, about Jim. So Jim is the curator of the P.K. Young Library of Florida history at the Smathers Library. And he holds his master's and doctoral uh, degrees in anthropology from uh, University of Florida. As the curator of the Young Library, Jim oversees a collection of over 25,000 books from the 1500s to the present, maintains a collection of 24,000 postcards, and he says it keeps growing, <laughs> and um, they're going to have to do something about it because nobody could really get in to see them, see them all. Um, 10,000 brochures and 3,000 citrus crate labels. Do you remember those? <laughs> um, so it's a wonderful uh, collection, and that's his day job. But uh, he's also a, a research historian by by training and by interest, I would say. Um, uh, he's, um, he's written several books. Um, uh, the most interesting one, I think, relating to what we're doing today is The Other War of 1812, The War and, and the American Invasion of Spanish East Florida. And that was published by University of Georgia Press. Um, and I would say, I have to say it's still available on Amazon and very favorably reviewed. It stood the test of time, Jim. Yeah, it, it, oddly enough, it, it really has. <laughs> it's, uh... um, Jim has also served on many boards related to uh, Florida history, um, the St. Augustine History Historical Society, the St. Augustine Research Institute, and many others. I understand he's just uh, going on the board of, um, uh, is that the St. Augustine? That would be uh, UF uh, Historic St. Yeah. Augustine. So he's got a wonderful background, um, and you're really going to enjoy his talk, so I'll just turn it over to Jim. Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks. Um, and do we want to switch to the... PowerPoint? Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming. It's been a while since I've been out here, and it's good to see you all. Um, the topic I chose for today, uh, and also if you can't hear, let, hear me, let me know and I'll, I'll adjust the mic. But um, the topic I, I chose today is one that I think about a lot. Uh, is Florida history American or US history? And I just want to tell you a little bit about why I think about that so much. Um, I've now been the head of the P.K. Young Library for 25 years, which is probably more shocking to me than to anybody else. It seems like I started just a, a couple years ago, not two and a half decades ago. Um, but during that you know, two and a half decades, I've often had to think about, OK, how, how do you best tell the history of Florida? And what do people need to know about the history of Florida? What's significant in the history of Florida that should be emphasized? Um, and that question is a little bit um, odd for me because I, I went to high school here in Florida and I've spent all my adult life practically in Florida. But I grew up in the Northeast. Um, and if you grow up in the Northeast, you grow up, you're raised with a very, very specific attitude towards what constitutes American history and what constitutes US history, all right? And so if you're from that area, um, you know, you get a lot of New England history. Uh, New England, of course, is, is, is home to Boston, it's home to Plymouth, uh, 
Uh, it's home to Harvard and Yale, which produced many of the historians who decided what to write into American history textbooks. Um, and you don't have to go very far in that area before you're at the house of Emily Dickinson, or you're at the house of Herman Melville, or you're at the house of Nathaniel Hawthorne, or you're at the house of Mark Twain. It goes on and on and on. It's the home of Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond. Uh, and if you, you know, stretch a little and go outside New England over to, to Philly and Pennsylvania, then you've got Independence Hall and you've also got Gettysburg, right? The turning point or one of the turning points of the American Civil War. Um, and so it's fairly natural if you grow up there to think that the history of the United States is basically the history of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and New England. And everything else is provincial. Um, it's like on the sidelines, even Virginia on the sidelines. Um, and certainly I grew up that way. I mean, I, I grew up in a town which the, the claim to fame of the town was A, it was built uh, on the lands of a, of a farmstead from the Revolutionary War, and, uh, and, and B, uh, that uh, Washington's right flank uh, had, you know, passed through one night there on a ridge um, on the retreat, uh, you know, from the attack on the Hessians when they were going back uh, towards Valley Forge. Um, and everybody knew that, and we all had, you know, we all had to learn that kind of stuff. Um, but the interesting thing is that, you know, if you decide what's important in history, a lot of times depends on when you, where you were born, where you were raised. And for people born in Chicago or Miami or New Orleans, New England's history can seem a little bit on the provincial and, you know, inwardly focused side when it comes to United States history and American history. Um, so for years, when I had to go out and talk to teachers, K through 12 teachers at workshops, what I would tell them was, if you read a lot of books on US history, you might not see anything at all about Florida. But if you actually learn Florida's history, you will end up learning almost everything that's significant about American and US history. Um, and so what I'm going to try and do is see if I can convince you of that uh, today. Right? Um, let me make sure this is on. All right, so let's start with this, right? It's that time of year, right? We're in October, November's coming. If you see a picture of this, what do you think of? It's, 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 it's Thanksgiving, right? Pilgrim, pilgrims and Indians sharing a meal at Plymouth. Um, and I mean, every, if you're American and you see this, you know what it means, right? It, you know, it means it's time to get a turkey it's time to think about inviting the family over. It's time to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? You couldn't get better advertising for an event than having it as a national holiday, right? I mean, I mean, Thanksgiving is like, you know, the, the, I remember living in England and having to explain Thanksgiving uh, to my British friends. They understood the 4th of July, but Thanksgiving they didn't get. They were, they were like, what is that all about? Um, so, um, so, but it's iconic, right? I mean, you know, thanks, thanks, you know, Thanksgiving is 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 an American holiday. Um, the funny thing is, though, that as often as we see this picture, the truth of the matter is that Thanksgiving in the Plymouth Colony came along fairly late in the founding of colonies in the New World, um, and uh, and by way of example, people in Europe were reading books, buying books, and reading books with these images in them before the Mayflower ever set sail, right? Um, and on the one side here, you see one of the prints that occurred in an early account of French exploration of Florida in 1562 and 1564, and it's showing how the local uh, Tamuqua of northeastern uh, Florida, you know, smoked meats and what kind of foods were in their diets and things. And this was all in circulation in 1591. 
uh, um, at, at, in, at, 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 in book fairs you know, all over Europe. And on the other side, you see John White's image of a Powhatan Indian village uh, in Virginia um, from about 1585. Um, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, these, these appeared in a long series of books on explorations of the New World. I think it was maybe 30 volumes in all. And that volume on Virginia, that was volume one. It's the first one to come out. And it was so popular and sold so well that Theodore Debris, who brought it out, uh, made the, the book on Florida volume two. And it also did very well. Um, and so he was bringing out books about the exploration of Virginia and Florida even before he produced the books on like Mexico or Peru or the, you know, the, other, the really big famous you know, uh, colonies. It was actually these colonies that came out first. So people were already familiar with the fact that there were colonies across the Atlantic on North America um, uh, by, the, you know, by the end of the, of the 1500s. Um, and they had some idea of the people who lived there and, uh, and what those colonies were like. Uh, and just by, you know, kind of way of expanding on that, this is a, this is a map uh, from the late 1500s um, showing the American Southeast, right? I mean, that, you know, there's enough there that you can pick out Florida and the Gulf Coast uh, and the you know the coast of Texas where Galveston would be, and that you know, and that it's going up into Georgia and maybe a little bit of South Carolina uh, and some of the interior. Um, you know, these maps were already out there uh, and in print. And in fact, you know, the 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 Pilgrims when they when they set sail, they knew where they were going or they knew where they were supposed to be going. Right? They they were going to go to what was then Virginia. Uh, they weren't going to go to the section that's now the state of Virginia. They were going to go actually to Hudson's, uh, Hudson's Bay. But that area had already been explored. It had already been mapped. It wasn't unknown. They knew it was there. Uh, and they got blown off course, you know, as we know. And, they, and so they ended up further north in Hudson's Bay in, in, in New England. And that's, and that's why they founded the, the, the colony of Plymouth. Um, but this map is actually a map that's based on the Hernan de Soto expedition into the southeast, which was in 1539. Um, so 90 years before Plymouth was, you know, established. And most of the names that you see there, although they're probably not in the correct places, are names of Indian towns and Indian villages that are in the de Soto Chronicles, that were named in the Chronicles. And you can see that, I mean, uh, you know, de Soto, you know, essentially, let's see if I can do this. He came ashore here at Tampa Bay and went north and over in this way. And then he cut way east and went like over here. And then he went around in a big circle over here. And then he went out, you know, eventually to the Mississippi River. So he covered, or his expedition covered a lot of territory. Um, and, uh, um, and is really the, 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 you know, the first, the earliest accounts we have of what would eventually become the U.S. South. Um, a map from slightly later. Uh, this is a modern reproduction of it, but it's based on an original map. Um, again, you know, I mean, you know, we start often, you know, the story with uh, the landing of the Mayflower and the Pilgrims meeting the, the Indians in the Plymouth area. But this is a whole series of, you know, mis oops, sorry, of mission settlements that run up the coast of Florida into Georgia and then across Florida um, over into the Big Bend area and then over into the Panhandle. Um, and you know all of these all of these towns were known. We have you know they're all recorded. We have documents and letters and reports and things from all of these areas, um, and uh, um, and you know and so I mean again you know Florida in the in the late 1500s and then in the early to mid 1600s was very well known, very well documented, um, and you know 
many of these places are still places that are significant in some way today. Um, so for instance, right here, we have the mission of San Luis. Well, that's the mission in Tallahassee that's been reconstructed, right? You can, you can go there today and actually walk around and see what that mission actually looked like. There's a huge Native American council house there. It was the territory of the Appalachee. Uh, the Appalachee themselves are still here. They don't live in Florida anymore. They now live in Louisiana. Uh, there's a, a, a small um, kind of extended kin group of Appalachee living in Louisiana um, who can trace their ancestry through documents, actually, right through ch church documents and other documents, right back to this site. So they know that that's where they're from because uh, they have the you know they have all the records that show that it is. Um, and there's talk, you know, they, they're negotiating with the state of Florida now to see if they can get, you know, some, you know, small piece of land here where they could hold, you know, get togethers and annual meetings and things back in what would be their, their traditional homeland. Um, but I mean, oops, I keep hitting the wrong thing there. Um, but, you know, but all of this area still has ties to us today. Um, and by the same token, you know, this is, you know, I think the subtitle on this was like cutting edge research. Well, this isn't my cutting edge research, but uh, at the University of Florida and also at uh, uh, um, University of California, San Diego, I believe, um, they're now working on the language of all the Native Americans, all the Native groups that lived in this area, which was, those, that was, those were the Tamuquan Indians. Now, Tamuqua, the language, Tamuqua language, no one speaks it anymore. Uh, it's a dead language. Um, but there are, um, there are versions of it from the 1600s that have Spanish translations. And so it's possible to look at the actual Tamuqua as it's written down and look at the Spanish and then try and, you know, analyze the Tamuqua to figure out what the vocabulary is, what the grammar is, how the, how the language worked. And there's now they've you know uh, you know Aaron Broadwell, who's our, our linguist in our anthropology department, um, has found dozens of other uh, texts in Tamuqua, no translations, just the Tamuqua. But he and his students and other professors have all been basically trying to decode the language. Um, it's kind of like you know the Rosetta Stone type of thing in uh, uh, in the old world. And they've now actually gotten to the point where they can take some of the texts that were not translated into Spanish and they can figure out what they're saying. They're, they're slowly, they'll probably never be able to figure out every single word in the text, but they're getting a lot of it. Um, and so again, you know, another, you know, another thing that's happening, you know, right now and in, in, in Florida is, you know, I mean, you know, how often do people recover a dead language basically and find out what's, written in unknown text, but it's going on right now in, in, in Florida. Uh, and it will probably reveal an awful lot about what, you know, was happening, you know, all along uh, northern Florida and southern Georgia. Um, again, something that, that, that historians need to pay attention to because it will be all new information. No one's ever been able to translate these texts before. Um, we'll go a little bit further, right? Um, very, you know, Big part of the uh, you know story for American history is the the rise of slavery through the African slave trade, and then the the abolition or overthrow of slavery, which you know comes through the Civil War, right? Um, and you can't really under you can't really study American history. You certainly can't study the 19th century in America without you know studying the Civil War and what led up to it. Um, but the thing is that that, you know, that struggle and that question about slavery and resistance to slavery goes back way before 1861 in the American Civil War. Um, and again, there's a Florida connection to it because in the 1600s, you know, slaves were actually running away from plantations in the British colonies. They were running away from South Carolina, later from Georgia, also from Virginia. And they were fleeing into Florida, which was Spanish territory. And uh, by proclamation of the king at that time, uh, they were told that if they were willing to convert to Catholicism, which was the official religion for the colony, 
And if the men were willing to participate in the defense of the colony, then they would be safe here, they would have sanctuary here, and they would also be free. Um, and by the early 1700s, there's actually a community of free people of color living just north of, uh, of uh, St. Augustine in Florida. This is at a time when most blacks in North America were living in slavery. There was actually, there was actually a town in Florida of free people. Um, and this is actually depicting one of the conflicts that occurred as a result of that. Um, this was not, as you can imagine, a popular policy uh, in Georgia or South Carolina. Um, and during the early 1700s, uh, settlers and uh, armed forces from South Carolina invaded Florida uh, and attacked Florida uh, in part, you know, over opposition to this idea that there were going to be, you know, former slaves living here free. Um, and then in 1739, 1740, there was a, a, a second, you know, major conflict uh, that uh, originated in Georgia. Uh, and this is one of the battles uh, that takes place just north of St. Augustine from that conflict with Georgia. This is the Battle of Fort Mose. Fort Mose also a known location, right? Archaeologists from the U from University of Florida have found that site and excavated it. There's now a museum there telling the story of the fort. There's uh, a campaign on now to actually raise money to reconstruct the fort. They're not going to reconstruct it on the exact site of the fort itself because it would damage the archaeological site. But they want to they want to make a a replica of it, you know, something that resembles it nearby so that when people come to the museum, they can also walk into what would have been the main feature of the settlement and see what it looked like and what it was like. Um, this is, uh, that's a rendering of it. Uh, this is the one that existed in the 1750s, just north of St. Augustine. Um, I actually worked on that archeological dig one year, and I think that year was the year that we found this. Um, it's all eroded, of course, because this was all earthenwork, but what we found was the moat or the ditch that went around it. And the ditch, as you can imagine, had the exact shape of this little bastion that was sticking out there. So we knew that that was where the bastion was because the, the moat around it preserved the shape of it. So we knew where that corner of the fort was. Um, again, you know, this is, you know, I, you know, one thing I used to tell the teachers was, uh, you know, if, if you have to talk about complex subjects, if you have to get into things like uh, slavery and the abolition movement and, uh, you know, why the Civil War started and what was at stake at the Civil War, you know, obviously you're going to talk about the larger scale things that happened at a national level, but you've always got a Florida tie-in. And that's, that was really my, po my point that I was trying to make, was that you can always use your own state history to give you know, your students kind of concrete examples of things that were happening in Florida that were tied to much bigger stories or much bigger events um, later on. Um, another interesting thing about you know, Fort Mose and its history is it was actually the beginnings of a long, long tradition of black soldiers uh, fighting in Florida, of, of black military life in Florida. Um, which goes all the way up again to the Civil War. Um, again, Florida was in many ways on the edge of the Civil War, um, but we did um, actually have fairly um, famous units um, down here, the 54th Massachusetts, which is the subject of the movie Glory, um, you know, uh, fought in Florida. They, you know, they, they were the, they were the, uh, the reserve unit at the Battle of Alusti and basically um, had to take the field and uh, defend the Union Army at Alusti because it had to retreat. Uh, and it also taken a lot of casualties. Um, and so to prevent the Confederate forces from following and essentially finishing off the Union Army, um, the 54th uh, was you know, behind the army, basically staving off any further attack as uh, the army retreated back to Jacksonville. Um, but the 54th was here, the first, uh, the first South Carolina was another famous black unit that operated out of Fernandina and Jacksonville. Um, and again, you know, I mean, these aren't 
these stories of these units aren't just, even though they're talking about things that are happening in Florida, these units were, you know, are, are, are famous, you know, for their efforts and for uh, the campaigns that they waged throughout the Civil War. It just happens that one of those campaigns happened to be in Florida. Um, all right, I'm gonna just broaden that out a little bit about, all right, so what other touchstones in Florida do we have, you know, that seem to talk about or be relevant to broader American history? Well, you know, the American Revolution. Now, I mean, again, I was, I was brought up with an easy driving distance, you know, of, you know, Valley Forge uh, and, uh, you know, you know all, the, all, all the sites up northeast. Uh, when I was growing up, I would not have associated Florida in any way whatsoever with the American Revolution. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it played a fairly significant role in the American Revolution. And that's because Florida during the Revolution was British. St. Augustine was, was British. Pensacola was British. Um, actually, at that time, Mobile and Natchez and Baton Rouge, they were all part of British Florida. They were all British. Um, and when Spain came into the war, Spain mustered forces in Spanish Louisiana, and they mustered forces in Cuba. And they began basically an assault against the British forces mostly in West Florida, and one by one, you know, captured um, all the towns back again. What we're seeing here is the siege of Pensacola, which occurs in the spring of 1781 uh, and is a Spanish victory. The, um, the, the British forces there have to surrender. They have to turn Pensacola over to the Spanish, uh, who, you know, hold that, you know, for the remainder of the American Revolution. Um, and uh, again, when I'm you know, when I'm talking to teachers, I'm 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 like, people don't always pay that much attention to the Battle of Pensacola. But I said they paid attention to it in England, all right, because they had been getting bad news from the very beginning of the American Revolution, right? You know, General Burgoyne's army had been forced to surrender, you know, up in Canada. Um, this army was now on its way back to England because they had been forced to surrender in 1781. And then what else happens in 1781, you know, right when they're getting used to this, you know, Yorktown, right? Four months after this. So, you know, so I tell people, you know, the British didn't lose two major, or one major battle and one major army in 1781, they lost two. First, they lost Pensacola, which was bad enough. And then the news comes that they've also lost Yorktown. Um, and it's no wonder that, you know, in England, everybody decided, well, that's the finish of it. We don't want to invest any more money in this conflict. We don't, we're not sending any more armies to North America. Um, so, um, so this was really the, the, you know, the first of kind of a one-two punch that ended up, you know, bringing Britain and France and Spain and the United States to the treaty table to end the American War of Independence. Um, so, um, so it's not a minor thing at all. It's actually fairly central to you know what was going on. Uh, Civil War, same thing. We didn't. We don't have a lot of you know major battle sites here. We weren't at the center of things. But um, I like this map because it reminds us how coastal Florida is. Right. Um, we have more coast than any other state in the United States. Um, and so Florida was really um, a theater for the Union Navy. The Union Navy was mostly what was active um, down and around Florida because they were trying to close off all the ports um, and, uh, you know, and keep supplies and things from coming into Florida. Uh, Florida was the third state to secede from the Union and its government was Confederate. Most of its, most of its men uh, fought for the Confederacy. Um, but another interesting thing about Florida is that during the Civil War, it really, there really was a civil war here. Not everybody in Florida sympathized with the Union there were, or with the, the Confederacy. There were a lot of Union sympathiz sympath sympathizers uh, in Florida. Uh, Jacksonville was a stronghold of Union sympathy. Key West was, uh, Fernandina was. Um, and also during the war, um, the Union held almost all the major seaports. 
Fernandina was in Union hands. St. Augustine was in Union hands. Key West in Union hands. Jacksonville on and off in Union hands. Pensacola was in Union hands. Um, and Tampa was in Union hands. So the whole seacoast uh, basically uh, was Union, while the interior of the state tended to be a Confederate stronghold. Um, uh, and another touching point, right at the beginning of the war, you know, the famous conflict, right, the match that lights the Civil War, where the first shots are, that's Fort Sumter, right off of South Carolina. But people often forget that at the same time that the Union and the Confederates were facing each other at Fort Sumter, they were also facing each other at Pensacola, right? The Confederates were on the mainland in the town in Pensacola, and the, the Union, because of its Navy, took the barrier islands. They took Santa Rosa Island and they had Fort Pickens. And so it was the same situation, right? Which was, you know, the Confederates wanted the Union to surrender those forts, which, you know, they considered to be now in Confederate territory. The Union forces would not. Um, and so it was only really a matter of timing that the Civil War started in South Carolina rather than in Florida. Um, because just a few months after the, f the fighting in uh, Fort Sumter, fighting broke out in Pensacola, exactly the same thing, right? The Confederates were trying to push the Union Army off of Santa Rosa Island. Um, and here we see men of the New York volunteers are out on Santa Ro Rosa Island trying to repel that attack. Um, and the difference here is that actually uh, the Union actually managed to maintain hold of the island uh, and, ev and eventually um, there's a peaceful turnover of Pensacola. The Confederate uh, forces there are needed elsewhere. They decide there's no point in trying to hold Pensacola when they don't control the port and they can't, they can't get ships in and out. Um, so they pull out of Pensacola and the Union takes over. Um, but again, very, very similar situation. I mean, the, you know, 1861, these, you know, these tensions that we see at, at Fort Sumter, we're seeing them right here in Florida as well. Um, all right, so the point I was going to make here. Um, first, that a lot of Florida's history, in fact, most of Florida's history, I would argue, uh, touches on much bigger issues. And that's why I say if you start learning Florida's history, you have to learn American history, right? The, you know, the, the um, taking of Pensacola in the American Revolution doesn't mean anything, doesn't, you know, doesn't, you don't understand it unless you understand the bigger context of what's going on with the American Revolution. Um, what's going on here in the Civil War only makes sense if you start learning about what the, what the bigger picture is, right? Um, so there's always these things that, uh, um, that lead back into our larger American history and feed into our larger American history. Um, and so I'll, again, what I always told people is you can always use Florida's history as sort of a springboard uh, into broader national history. It's not hard to do. I mean, if you, if, you, if you know state history, you've always got a way to start talking about national history. Um, and, you know, just by way, one, this, is, this is my last example, but by way of last example, we'll talk about this guy for a moment, right? Seventh president of the United States, probably the most famous president between, you know, like Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln, Andrew Jackson, right? Um, Andrew Jackson is very, very, very closely associated with Florida. Now, Tennesseans would say, are, are, are you crazy? He's a Tennessean. Um, you know, he's ours. But the fact of the matter is, he was in Florida three times, never in Jacksonville. <laughs> Jacksonville's named after Jackson. He never went there. Uh, he went three times, all three times. Anybody want to guess where? Pensacola. Pensacola is the real Jacksonville, because that's where he always went. Hated it, hated Pensacola, always ended up there. First time was in the War of 1812. Uh, he, was, uh, he was fighting the Creek Indians in the area. He learned that a British squadron had gone into Pensacola Bay. And so he, against the rules of war, basically, and against his own instructions, he attacked Pensacola, seized it forced the British out of Pensacola, and then had to leave immediately because he had to go further west to New Orleans for the, you know, to, to stop the British invasion at the famous Battle of New Orleans. But that was the first time uh, in 1814. Uh, later, he was put in charge of what became the first Seminole War, uh, 
And you can see it, you know, the first Seminole War basically was, took place all in the Big Bend area, 1817, 1818. This was all led by Jackson in here. But at the end of it, he makes another quick run <laughs> over to Pensacola. And he takes Pensacola a second time. And this time he expels the Spanish government. He puts everybody on a boat, the troops, the governor, everybody, and tells them to go to Cuba and writes to Washington saying, I've got Pensacola for you. Um, we had to give it back. Um, we ended up giving it back, but not for very long. Um, because 1821, Florida becomes an American territory. We get our first military governor who's going to basically make his headquarters in Pensacola. And who's our first military governor? The first governor, Andrew Jackson. Right. Um, so again, you, you know, you can't actually tell the story of Andrew Jackson or the biography of Andrew Jackson if you leave Florida out. I mean, he was down here a lot and all of his moves in Florida were extremely controversial. They always raised, they always raised a, a diplomatic controversy with Spain and Britain that had to be dealt with. There were congressional investigations of him, um, which you know, we all know about congressional investigations because they seem to be going on always, but Jackson was a subject of a lot of congressional investigations. He was investigated for the first Seminole War. Uh, he was investigated for his, you know, his initial 1814 taking of Pensacola. Um, and they all figure uh, in his presidential campaigns. Uh, when he ran for president, all the stuff was dredged up and people who were anti-Jackson, you know, kept saying, Look at how he behaved in Florida. You don't want this man for your president, right? He's dictatorial. He's overly militaristic. You know, he does what he wants. He doesn't obey the rules. I mean, a lot of that was out there uh, during both of his runs for the presidency. Um, so even, you know, even experts on Andrew Jackson will say, well, you, you, you know, you have to know what he did in Florida because it affected his entire career and it, and it became, you know, part of the, the, uh, uh, the presidential's debate, basically, when he was running for office. And then last but not least, I'm going to leave it here. But, you know, this was the first Seminole War. What happens is, you know, in Florida, that leads almost directly to the second Seminole War, right? Um, the Seminoles are defeated in the first Seminole War, but they're not really defeated. What happens is that Jackson takes over their towns uh, and then raises the towns so that they can't resettle there. Uh, but the people themselves all evacuated before he got there and moved. Um, and so there's a great deal, you know, there's a great deal of tension that builds between frontiers people and, and Floridians and the Miccosukee and Seminoles over the next 20 years. Um, and that, of course, leads to, you know, one of the things that, you know, kind of defines Florida in the 19th century, which is the Second Seminole War, a really long military campaign uh, that the Seminoles you know, waged in an effort to uh, stay in their homeland and not go west. And this, again, feeds into all sorts of things. It feeds into the story of removal that affects like the Creeks, the Cherokees, the Choctaws. Um, but it also feeds into modern day Florida because the Miccosukee and the Florida Seminole who are here today they're the descendants, basically, of the people who managed, you know, to evade the armies and defend themselves and, and stay in Florida during this time period. So there's a direct connection, you know, with modern day Florida and with, you know, modern day ideas about, you know, Native American rights, Native American culture. Um, it's again, very, it's very, it's not very, just only very central to Florida's history, but it's central to American history. Um, all right, I'm going to leave it there and see if there's any questions. I just want to, I want to thank you all for um, inviting me and setting up this talk. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jim. That was great. Uh, any questions for Jim? I, I had one thing that struck me. When you showed uh, Fort, Mos Fort mm -hmm. Moses, um, you had that uh, sort of look, aerial sort of view of the of the fort itself. Reminded me of um, the St. Augustine. It's um yeah, the fort is uh, three miles north of St. Augustine, mm -hmm. 
And if you, if you know the St. Augustine area, you know there's a river called the, the North River that you know, feeds down into the, the bay by the Castillo and St. Augustine. And there's all these little tributary creeks that like feed into the North River. Um, and the fort was built right on a meander, like you know, one of these kind of you know, spaghetti loop type things that goes like that. It was right out there, you know, right where the little turn is. And that was one of the reasons why they were able to find it is because it's on the maps and that meander is still there. That river has not changed route or changed um, or, or changed its, its shape. And so by, by looking for that, you know, by going and looking for that meander, um, they were able to figure out, you know, pretty close to, you know, where the fort had to be. Um, so, uh, um, but, uh, but yeah, you know the but uh, the but the aerial view is very similar to what the view is on the 18th century maps because they're also yeah. looking at it from above, and that's you know so yeah. you can kind of see the outlines of it. And so. and it looks very similar, I think, to um, in Saint Augustine. What is it? Uh, the the, the Castillo de Sierra yeah. Fort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same yeah. principle. Same structure. Same principle. The same the, shape. The the idea here was that there was water protecting its back. Yeah. And then they had earthworks around it so that you, if you came by land, you'd have a tough time getting to it. I have a question back here, Jim. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, having not lived in Florida, I, don't, I was not taught Florida history in grade school or high school. But what did strike me is if you teach some of this in fourth or fifth grade, and again in high school, are you teaching something that might be considered woke? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I think the problem is that depending on who you're talking to today, almost anything can be considered woke. <laughs> so, um, you know, my, my answer to that is, you know, I, I run the P.K. Young Library of Florida History. Uh, that library started as a private collection in 1896. It was donated to the University of Florida in 1944, all right? Um, and we are collecting the same sorts of things now that were already in the collection then you know the, Julian Young had a tremendous interest in the colonial history of Florida, tremendous interest in the Civil War history of Florida, and so my my feeling is you know if you're if you're teaching things based on those sources and you want to argue that it's woke, then you have to argue that my mom and dad and everybody that fought World War II were woke, right? Because we started this in 1945. So, um, so, so, so my feeling would be, prove to me that everybody in 1944 and 1945 was, was teaching woke history, and then I'll concede that we're teaching things that are woke. But, um, but my mom's still living, <laughs> and she would probably uh, object strenuously to the idea that, um, that the things that she learned and the things that they were being taught in 1945 had anything to do with uh, you know, what is supposedly woke. It was American history. It was, it was understanding our country and exploring the history of our country. Um, and I would also have to say you know, that you know, I'm, you know, I, I, was, I was raised by, by the World War II generation, and most of them will, would laugh at the idea that you should not teach people any history that's negative or that makes people uncomfortable or that might be traumatic. You know, good luck teaching the history of World War II or the Great Depression and not touching on anything <laughs> that's worrisome, traumatic, negative, or stressful, right? I mean, they lived through it for Pete's sakes. Right, so they don't have very much sympathy with the idea that people shouldn't know about it. Um, uh, you know, part of history is 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 confronting and overcoming things that are not pleasant, 
So trying to, you know, trying to argue that no, we should spare children the idea, or high school students, or really young adults, the idea that there was anything in the past that maybe didn't go the way it should have gone, um, or there were any occasions in the past where maybe people should have behaved differently or better than the way they did behave, we shouldn't teach them any of that. I don't know, you know, I, my, my, my parents never had a problem being taught it when they were kids. I don't know why kids today should have, and I didn't have any problem being taught it when I was a kid. So. You mentioned Payne's Prairie, it mentioned on there Payne's Prairie and Fort King, and um, was Jackson o uh, overseeing the troops of, of uh, they burned Fort McAnope and the, and the Moses Levy's area also, or if so, I have a lot more work to do. <laughs> well, Jackson, <clears throat> Jackson essentially, he was, in, he was in office as president in the 1830s. So as commander in chief and head of the military, he basically gave the orders that started and, and, and ran the Second Seminole War, but he wasn't in charge. He wasn't, he wasn't a military officer in the, sh in the field at that time. Um, and uh, so that was, he was, he was more, that was more a policy uh, that was coming out of Washington. But no, the, the, everything in the Second Seminole War uh, happened under a whole series of commanders, you know, one of the again one of the one of the interesting things about the Second Seminole War is it lasted for seven years, and almost the entire U.S. Army of regular troops was in Florida at some point during those seven years. Um, Um, the, uh, it, it, well, it depends on who was in charge at the time. If, yeah, in 1835, 1836, the commanders were our, our, our governor at the time, uh, uh, Richard Keith Call, um, General Gaines uh, was, and General Scott were both uh, in charge of the army at that time, and eventually General Jessup. Um, so, uh, the, um, but they didn't, they didn't frequently, you know, they, they didn't frequently follow a burnt or a burnt earth policy. And in fact, they kind of did the opposite, which is that they decided the easiest way to, to win through that war was just to build forts everywhere, which is why so many places in <laughs> Florida have fort in front of them in, in their name. But every crossroads, every major river crossing that had a bridge usually had a fort by it to protect, you know, that, that, that roadway. Um, and, uh, and so by, eight, you know, by the 1840s, there, there were actually forts all over uh, Florida, you know, holding, basically holding little patches of land. Yeah, so... Am I going? Yeah, yeah. Okay. My education was in Florida also. And I had understood that Cedar Key was a big part of the Civil War. Did I get that information incorrectly? No, see, you know, Cedar Key was actually, a, that was a Confederate holdout. Uh, the Union never really managed to establish a presence there. Um, and it was one of the holes where, where um, you know, privateers and uh, could, you know, could break the, uh, the attempted encirclement of Florida, like the, you know, uh, and get out um, and, you know, either to trade goods or to bring goods back in. It did get shelled several times, you know, from sea. Um, but uh, Tallahassee always remained in Confederate hands. Cedar Key always remained in Confederate hands. Tampa was mostly in Confederate hands. Uh, Jacksonville, poor Jacksonville, just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all the way through the war, which is probably why there wasn't that much left of it by the end of the war. Um, so, uh, um, but no, Cedar Key, Cedar Key was important in, 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 in part because um, because of the, it was it, it gave it gave the Confederacy the ability, at least 
one port where they could where they could get shipments in and out. It was also for a while was the it was the terminal of the railroad, um, but um, uh, but the issue of the railroad was that Fernandina, which was the other end of the road, that was in Union hands. Um, and so the railroad could run from there, like over here to Gainesville and to the center and back again. It couldn't get to the other coast because it would have, I mean, they would have been taken prisoner basically. Um, and that's also one of the, that was also one of the big confrontations within the Confederate uh, government in Florida, which is that the, the state government wanted to rip up the railroad tracks uh, because they were being pressured by the national Confederate government to help build railroads in Georgia. And so Georgia wanted all Florida's railroad tracks. David Levy Uly, you know, who you know, built that railroad, uh, was trying just as hard to make them not tear up the railroad because he wanted to rebuild it at war's end. And he, you know, he didn't he didn't want basically just a lot of you know uh, empty railroad corridor with all with everything. So um, so the railroad was a real point of contention. Um, um, uh, everybody was struggling to control the railroad. The, the union w would have liked to have controlled it. David U Levy Uly wanted it left intact. Uh, the Confederacy, for national reasons, reasons of national defense, wanted actually all of the rail reused up in Georgia, um, and uh, and so that played out all the way, all the way through the conflict. Basically, most most of it did stay, but it took an enormous amount of rebuilding after the war to get it reconnected. So. Um, you mentioned the discovery of new Timucua documents. Um, where did they come from? Was it Spain or did any come from Cuba? It's really interesting, this story. Um, we knew about a lot of them uh, since the 1970s. I mean, I knew of them when I was a, a student. Uh, and some of them were religious documents. Um, the Franciscan friars were making uh, catechisms that taught, basically taught the Catholic faith. And they were also making a guide to confession uh, in Spanish and then in Timucuan. And the idea was that when they were teaching the catechism to a Timucuan speaking group, you know, you would, you know, you would use the Timucuan. And the same thing if, if, uh, if someone was coming to confession and their native language was Timucuan, they didn't speak much Spanish, you would have to ask them their questions and hear their responses in Timucua. So that part existed. And because of it, we, uh, we thought we knew what the Timucuan said because, you know, we were like, oh, look, the Franciscans wrote it in Spanish. And then what we thought was, the Franciscans had learned Timucuan and they wrote it in Timucuan. Well, since then, a whole bunch of other documents have turned up in Mexico, which is where the closest places where these things could be printed um, that are only in Timucuan. And, um, and people have gone, like, uh, like Aaron Broadwell, have gone back and actually looked even at the ones that were translated in Spanish. The most interesting thing they found out was we were wrong in the 1970s. Um, the Franciscans were not writing the Timucuan part of the book. They were writing the Spanish part of the book and Timucuan Indians who spoke Spanish, they were writing the Timucuan part of the book. So it wasn't being produced by the, by the friars, it was being produced by the laity, by the congregation. And it turns out that <laughs> frequently the Timucuans left out various parts of the catechism or the confessional questions that they didn't apparently agree with. And they're not in the Timucuan version at all. Um, so the fact that they can now translate these things and find it's, it's, it's just uncovering all sorts of things because, you know, we're, we're, we're like, oh, you know, this is not an exact copy of what's in Spanish. It's actually a slightly different text. It's saying slightly different things. And it's also telling us what those writers were willing to translate and what they weren't willing to translate into their own language, right? So it's, re it's becoming really, really interesting. I have no idea how they did it, by the way. Um, Aaron, Aaron is, is kind of an expert at deciphering and decoding languages. Um, and, uh, and they looked, you know, for, la for words that they didn't know, they would look at like where they were used over and over and over again. And then they would uh, gradually get a sense of, okay, we think this word must mean this. 
just because of the other words around it and where it's being used. And over the past six or seven years, they've managed to kind of construct a broader dictionary of the language. And of course, the more words they learn, the more they can apply that to, to figuring out what additional words are. Um, so it's gotten really, really interesting. Uh, a colleague of mine um, has published a book now on uh, you know, women's writings, Native American women's writings of the early Southeast. And she's using these Timucuan documents, well, a few years ago. She would have been able to put them in the book, but she would not have been able to tell anybody what they said because we wouldn't have known. Uh, Aaron Broadwell is our professor. Yeah, that's Alejandra uh, Dachewski, who is at um, University of California. I believe she's at San Diego. Um, and she's written a book, came out about three months ago, called Talking Back, Talking Back, Native American Women in the Southeast. And it's all based on texts that were written by Native American women or that are about Native American women. Um, they're not all Timucuan. She uses all sorts of different types of texts. But, um, but she is using the Timucuan ones. And I, 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 most of us were flabbergasted when we first heard about this a couple years ago. Um, you know, because I, 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 like, I was like, Aaron, how is that possible? Right? It's, it's like a dead language. I mean, how can you figure it, how can you figure it out? But he can. He's done it. So um, this will be the last question. Yes. Uh, who was the woman who wrote that book you just talked about? Uh, yeah, Alejandra. Alejandra. Dachevsky, which is D U B C O V S K Y. Dubchevsky, yes, Dubchevsky. And um, uh, I wondered uh, if you had any advice for uh, people who were interested in the Seminole Wars um, about going to the museum in Ocala or the museum in Micanopy. Uh, either are good. I mean, Fort King has now been reconstructed, and you can visit it, right? And there's and they Fort are, King is yeah yeah. Um, and uh, um, also, I would note that the Seminole Wars Foundation, which is like a not for profit, uh, has now opened up a library and a small museum. But I'd have to I'd have to get back to you about the location. They used to be in Dade City. I think they've relocated. Dade City. Uh, they they used to be in Dade City. Used but, to be in yeah, Dade. Yeah, but now I think they've I think they've moved closer to Tampa. I would have to go check. Okay. Um, okay. And have uh, you been to the museum in Micanopy? I I haven't been recently. I mean, I went earlier in my career uh -huh. uh, down there, um, um, but uh, not in the last three years. I haven't. Uh, they've been working hard because we do have a uh, a spot for a fort and it's been spotted as um, a fort Mickey for fort Micanopy. yeah no I mean yeah there, there were there's been there's been an archaeological testing and everything yeah, so, yeah yeah and uh, the museum uh, does its best to uh, help people understand the best we can do uh, sometimes it, sometimes it's best to tell the local story because the Seminole war seven years long it's a complicated story and frankly if you try and tell it all at once people just get lost so in some ways it's best to tell like what happened on the spot and then kind of give an idea of the broader context of it. it's um uh, it's a challenge but it is an interesting thing and we have had people who have done research and done their best to build uh, a model of Fort Micanopy and um, I would be interested to uh, know. Well, I'll have to check out what's going on down there. I, I worked long ago when they established their archives there. Um, but that was like five or six, maybe seven years ago now that I was w helping establish the archives. Yeah.
Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to come down. Another thing, another thing too would be maybe to invite, like all the scholars who are associated with this, this, um, uh, the Seminole Wars Foundation, to maybe like do a small symposium or something in Micanopy. They'd probably love to do that. And then you'd get like the the ten, the twelve people that know the history the best. They're the ones. They're all the ones that write the books on it. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Jim. Thank you again for, yeah, your, Jim. for your attendance. Thank you, Jim. Jim's got a meeting uh, at 3 o'clock back on campus, so we want to help him get away. Yeah. Um, uh, next week, we've got kind of a change from what you have in your bulletin. Um, uh, we're switching the last spot and the fourth, uh, the fourth spot, which is coming up. So, Neil where we'll be coming next week and he'll be talking about his personal research on um, um, different um, um, books for the blind and different languages and different uh, um, types of braille that were developed. Now, Neil is a great speaker. Yeah, uh, the, last, the last time he talked to us, we were, it was during the, um, pandemic, we were on Zoom, and he was talking about uh, King Arthur, um, you know, and, and uh, the ancient, ancient uh, history. But this is his personal, his personal uh, um, joy, his, his, not his day job. Uh, and, Yeah, yeah, he is. So, so um, um, remember that's next week, and then um, um, right, uh, and then Boyd uh, will be speaking at the end um, about uh, Yuli, uh, about the first two uh, Florida senators, uh, but that'll come at the end. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, for being here. We'll see you next week.